Hey guys, welcome to Cashcroft TV. My name, is Ka My name is Kaylin Ashcroft. Thanks for watching another video on ancient Greek and Roman history. Today we'll be doing Sertorius from ancient Rome and Eumenes from ancient Greece. I know this video is in the opposite order from all the former and for the with respect to future videos. This is just the way Plutarch wrote the book. So yeah, it's not an error once again. So Plutarch sort of opens up with this pretty long quote. I'll read it to you. I hope it doesn't bore you, but it does have a meaning, so I'll get there. It is no great wonder if in long process of time, while fortune takes her course hither and thither, numerous coincidences should spontaneously occur. If the number and variety of subjects to be wrought upon be infinite, it is all the more easy for fortune, with such an abundance of material, to effect this similarity of results. Or if, on the other hand, events are limited to the combinations of some finite number, then the necessity th the same must occur, must recur, and in the same sequence. So, basically it's a long quote, but it says that if the possibilities of outcome are infinite, the likelihood of coincidence is also infinite, or 100%. Similarly, if the po possibility of outcomes is finite, then it sort of repeats over the same finite possibilities and also leads to 100% certainty of coincidence. So basically, it's just a long way of saying history repeats itself, and that is something that he saw to be true in his own personal research into history and something I've seen to be true in history. Also, sort of the main thesis behind history repeats itself is that you should study it because... Um, many of these lessons still have real-world applications. So, cool. Let's begin with Sertorius. So, Sertorius and Plutarch sort of references this quote in respect to Sertorius in that there were three great leaders who also had one eye. He references Philip, Antigonus, and Hannibal all also had one eye, similar to Sertorius. And with respect to these leaders, he says that he was more continent than Philip, he was more a more faithful friend than Antigonus, and more merciful to his enemies than Hannibal. So he says, in terms of prudence and judgment, he gave place to none of them, but in fortune, he was inferior to all of them. So, kind of a, a compliment to Sartorius, and kind of sums up his character, if you know of these individuals as well. But, either way, we'll start off from the beginning of his life. So he came from a sort of a noble family of, from Nursia, which is Sabine territory. So as mentioned previously, at the inception of Rome, it was divided between Sabines and ethnic Romans. So Sabines were sort of like an ethnic minority, but there were still lots of them, and they were still able to climb the political ladder and able to achieve nobility. So not really an outsider, but still somewhat different. His father died when he was quite young. He was predominantly raised by his mother, Rhea, who he was very affectionate with and very close with, and she took a lot of care in educating him, or him as best as possible. He originally went to Rome with the intention of becoming an orator, which I find is strange because he was not really formally educated. Uh, Cicero, who is one of the greatest orators of all time, has this quote about him, goes as follows, of all the totally illiterate and rude orators, or actually ranters I have ever known, the roughest and readiest was Sertorius. So, kind of a compliment from from Cicero, but also indicative of Sertorius's rough character and upbringing, but also his somewhat ability to preach to the masses and win the affection. So, with that, he sort of, instead of pursuing a career in oration he ends up proving to be quite a good soldier one of the first anecdotes of him was he was fighting a, a battle just as a normal soldier and he he got wounds all over his body and to escape the enemy he jumps into the river and swims against the current and in full armor and plutarch says it proves that he was so well anewed to hardship was his body and i also think it's indicative of the his the toughness of mind in in addition to it, the toughness of body 
So either way, he ends up ultimately winning the affection and mentorship of Marius, who, as we mentioned earlier, there was sort of in the civil battle, it's called the civil war, the social war, sorry, of Rome between Scylla and Marius, where Marius represented the um, like the populism and Scylla represented the optim- optimates. Um, he sort of ends up falling under Marius's leadership. He first sort of wins his respect as a spy in barbarian territory. So during the battle, he dresses up in Celtic dress and sneaks into the across enemy lines against the Cimbri and Teutons. And he really impresses Marius and proves both his bravery, intelligence, and um, willingness to work hard. So ultimately, he ends up becoming a quaestor in Gaul. And with this, he sort of starts building an army for Marius that is later used in the social war. Um, Eventually, things break out and he sort of allies with Cena as well. Cena was probably the main supporter of Marius, followed by Sertorius. And eventually, Marius gets sent, he leaves, or he gets sent out of of Rome as a result of Scylla they push him out and he he gets sent down to Africa and he's very fearful of what might happen but fortunately Scylla just leaves leaves Rome and Cena plots to invite Marius back to take Rome. Sertorius is sort of worried because he knows that Marius will be very vengeful and really try to he sort of foreshadows the ultimate massacre that does end up taking place, and he tells Cena that they probably shouldn't invite Marius back. Cena sort of thinks, and it could also be true, that he is worried of the having to share the power with Marius, but it's essentially Marius was the leader at that time, and it was sort of inevitable that he would come back. So ultimately he does, and he takes back Rome, and they start a extreme amount of massacres. Um, and... Sertorius knows that he can't really convince Marius because Marius is quite a bit older and sort of a mentor of his, but he really tries to placate Cena and really tries to stop all the bloodshed, but with little avail. At one point, he blatantly defies Marius when Marius has this army of 4,000 slaves who he um, directs to rape and kill many supporters of Scylla. Of hearing of this, Sertorius decides to kill all these 4,000 slaves, so sort of indicative of his, his, his willingness to defy his master, but also the, what lengths he's willing to go to achieve justice for what he thinks is right. So I think he's a little bit more, despite the fact that it involved killing, he's a little bit more moral or a little more, had a bigger heart, yeah, a bit bigger heart than... Um, Marius or Cena, but either way, Scylla ultimately comes back. At C- Cena and Marius ultimately die. Marius just died, sort of a drunk old guy. But um, Scylla takes back the place, and he sort of gets sent out, or he gets forced out of of Rome, and he ends up going to Spain. He hires this or assigns this general named Salinator to block the Pyrenees Pass. But unfortunately, he is pushed out by one of Scylla's generals and ultimately forced down to Africa. With that, his, this Hispanias sort of start wanting, rebelling against Scylla, and they elect Sertorius as one of their leaders to sort of start their own state and start fighting for their own independence. They, a lot of them were already ready to rebel, others they conquered, but ultimately he ends up capturing pretty near, much nearly all of Hispania. Hispania is um, later, it's pretty much the territory of Spain. So for about a six year period, he becomes sort of the absolute leader of Hispania, sort of starts his own state in Europe, and he l- leads it under the philosophy of consent, leading under consent to be governed and cooperation with the people he establishes he tries to establish roman civility at the time hispanias were very much barbarians and very ill-refined he starts schools where he would educate them in roman customs and they would even wear roman clothes 
um, he establishes a 300 member senate which was predominantly comprised of expats from Rome but it also included many uh, of the more powerful people from Hispania so it was nice that he was including them in their government he sort of wins the also the religious leadership of the country he is given a gift of a white fawn a and he keeps it and says that it is the white fawn of Diana, and he says that he can speak to the god through Diana. So with this, somehow he also manages to gain religious leadership of the state too. So he becomes really quite powerful. But with this, Scylla sends off, or, well, Scylla was kind of moving on, but he sends off Pompey and Metellus to sort of, fight him and finish him off in the Hispanias. So, and as you know, Pompey, and we will discuss next day, is a very powerful leader, as was Metellus, and 2 verse 1 was quite a battle, but he met, ends up putting a, a very, very good fight against them. Now, on many different occasions, he defeats them where their numbers are better, and the people of Hispania ultimately end up referring to him as the new Hannibal. But ultimately, since the Romans keep get, kept getting re reinforcements, they eventually had to result, resort to guerrilla warfare, which he has this quote. He goes to, in motivating his army, he plucks a hair off a horse, and he shows them that the horse doesn't get startled. But if he were to grab a bunch of hair, it would startle a horse. So he has this quote, Perseverance is more prevailing than violence, and many things which cannot be overcome when they are together yield themselves up when taken little by little. So he sort of results to guerrilla warfare and wins micro battles to ultimately or try to fight against Pompey and Metellus. That's why I think it's kind of interesting that he is con compared to, uh, to the new Hannibal. I think it would make more sense to be called the new Fabius, who is the one who essentially invented guerrilla warfare. But... Either way, I guess Hannibal was more famous, so they thought it more fitting to call him the new Hannibal, or perhaps it was on account of his one eye, which Hannibal also had. But ultimately, they result in some kind of, kind of harsher tactics. They say, any Roman who captures Satoria shall be given 100 talents of silver and 20,000 acres of land, and any exiles will be allowed to return to Rome. So he starts getting very, very nervous and very, very paranoid, and many of the Romans who were on his senate sort of start losing faith in Sertorius since the Roman army was just too big to be defeated. And ultimately, they saw there was a lot of gain if they were to remove Sertorius from power. So at one point, as the Hispanias were sort of at an almost complete decline, they, had, they held this meal, a big feast for Sertorius. And... Other than the fact that they overfed him, they overfed him to try to get him to sit on the couch. It was altogether otherwise a normal meal. And while sitting on the couch, they stab him. So a pretty tragic death for an individual. But the main takeaway that Plutarch notes for Sertorius is that he was an outsider in that he left the Hispanias when he was from, from Rome and managed to put up a huge and impressive fight against his own and powerful peoples. So, yeah, we'll get back to, we'll talk more about this guy in the comparison. And let's us begin with Umines. So, Umines was from a poor wagoner's son. He was actually Thracian, which was sort of an outsider in a Macedonian state. At one point, Philip, who was Alexander the Great's father, supposedly was walking by while Umines was wrestling. And he was impressed with his intellect and bravery and tasked upon himself to train him and teach him. Others say, and Plutarch also say, could be possible that Philip was good friends with Umini's peasant wagoner father and for that reason wanted to invest in Umini's. But regardless, he, wanted, he saw something in Umini's and he wanted to support him. And ultimately, he ends up becoming his principal secretary and upon his death, he becomes the principal secretary of Alexander the Great who we will talk about and is probably the, the greatest um, conqueror in history. So either way, he it's pointed out that he wasn't all, or he had a sort of healthy relationship with Alexander. It wasn't just 
that he was an employee or rather even a slave of Alexander. At many times he defied him and Alexander showed affection for him as well. There's the anecdote where Alexander asked for a bunch of financing from individuals and he asked Umini's, asked Umini's 300, uh, 300 talents or 300 silver, I believe it was, and he only sends him 100. So Alexander sends the orders to go burn down his tent and leave only the gold just to show him how much he, uh, how he defied him. Upon giving the orders, he really regrets and re really regrets what he had done. And he burns down the place and de decides not even to take the gold. And he feels really bad and restores all his papers and leaves Umini's with all his money. So I think it's just twofold it's indicative of their healthy relationship and that alexander respected umini's despite his poor upbringing and also their good temper in not getting too upset and not going to too rash actions when either each other defied the other so they were sort of temperate in that regard ultimately alexander the great dies and there's a the the empire needs to be divided up and there's a huge short sort of d d huge many micro battles deciding who's going to lead the state and it never really achieves its former glory this the, this will be a little bit more difficult to understand unless you see the alexander the great video but ultimately Critias and Antipater tried to take Asia, so he was granted to protect the lands of Capatia and Phalagonia, and he was assigned this by Perdiccas. Perdiccas was sort of representing Alexander's heir's interest, and he sent Umenes to sort of protect these states in Asia. But Critias and Anti Antipater tried taking Asia, and they first tried going for Capatia, which was the closer state that he was set to defend. He fortunately manages to kill Craterus, and Neopolitolemus also tries taking the land, but he managed to defend it off for quite a long while, until ultimately cassander and antigonus and ptolemy team up to try to take this land and he's sort of forced to hide in nor which is kind of on the border but he's up against such a big threat that it's really quite challenging and similar to sartorius he manages to win many fights where he had fewer numbers and proves himself to be quite a good general ultimately though one of his soldiers named pusestas loses their it's called their essentially their loot which consisted not only of women and children but 30 years worth of spoils of war and most importantly the silver shields which were their some of the most prized possessions in of alexander the great's army and they offer to give back all these goods to the heir of alexander in exchange for Umini's. So Umini, Umini's is given in as a slave. And as a slave, he is starved for three days and he's really, he's upset because he wanted to die in the battlefield and he thought it was not a noble way to die. But ultimately he is starved for three days and then executed at the, at the cause of Antigonus. And sort of not the best way to die, but he proved to be very very uh, very reliable in supporting the interests of Alexander's heir and very not too greedy in that regards so either way we'll go to the comparison so I guess there I I find I'm pretty surprised that these two are compared I don't see too much comparison in that except that they were both outsiders that's the one Plutarch notes most notably Umenes was a Thracian supporting Macedonian interests, and he didn't come from a military background. He came from a, um, a secretary, a secretary background. Whereas 
Sertorius was of Sabine heritage, which was not complete, complete outsider when he was in Rome, but when he represented the his Hispanias or fought for the Hispanias, he was a complete outsider in that regard, and both managed to achieve quite a bit of success and won quite a few battles. Sertorius managed to achieve full power of those he was supporting, whereas Eumenes was sort of just a, a pawn in a much larger sort of diplomatic dispute. He never really, he never even conquered his own two territories that he was supposed to, Capatia and Paphagonia. Similarly, Sertorius was pushing for peace sort of his whole life when Marius and Sina were massacring tons of people. He was trying to um, placate this and try to placate his two allies and even his Hispanias. He was not, he was trying to create a good state and good government. However, he was constantly being attacked by Pompey and Metellus, which made things much more difficult. Whereas Umenes, it is said, sought out war. He wanted to really expand and re reestablish Alexander the Great's empire and Plutarch says that he could have settled for second place and if he had done that Antigonus would have been fine taking first place and he could have established another smaller state but instead he wanted to restore the entirety of Alexander the Great's empire and in doing so ultimately resulted in his death and probably the failure of Macedonia ever to reach greatness again. Additionally, there are two deaths. Plutarch always talks about the comparisons of deaths. Sertorius, his death was, was he expected it coming. So he had a long period where he was very, very worried about being murdered or being assassinated, assassinated especially considering there was the, the booty, bounty on his head. Whereas... Umini's it sort of came at a surprise he was suddenly captured but usually Plutarch criticizes someone if they die in captivity but in Umini's respect in Umini's case he was sort of there wasn't really much he could do he starved himself and he really wanted to return to the battlefield and it's more about his intent than the way he actually died so both had a pretty decent life in that regards. Uh, the very last thing Plutarch compares them with is that Sertorius sort of was formally trained in war in the sense that he came from a war background. He fought many battles before he became a general, whereas Eumenes sort of started off as a more, well, as a secretary and then became a general, which might have been a bit harder of an uphill battle. But I kind of criticize this point in that he worked under Alexander the Great and he must have learned some great, great lessons from him and probably better lessons learned from Alexander than Sertorius might have learned from Marius. So yeah, that's Sertorius and Umenes. I hope you liked the video. Next day we will be doing Pompey and... Pompey and... Agilus. So Pompey from Rome and Ageless from Ancient Greece. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope you watch the next one. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.